Greetings, folks, and welcome to the Middle English period. This is probably the period, well, I would say definitely the period, during which the English language undergoes its most profound and rapid changes. To start, this week, as we're looking mostly at the earlier part of the Middle English period, we'll talk about the Norman invasion and its immediate consequences, and then next week and maybe the week following, play out some of those consequences in terms of how they look in various dialects of Middle English, tying it into the very interesting history of the roughly 450-year period that we'll be looking at. Oh, speaking of periods, and this came up in our class discussion on Friday when somebody asked, and I'm sorry I forget exactly who, what exactly was the division between the Old English and Middle English period? As I explained then, but of, of course not everybody was there, generally speaking, linguists distinguish between Old English and Middle English around 1050, that is just a relatively few years before the Norman invasion. The reason being that there were already changes in progress in the language before the Normans came that would have played out almost certainly in some way similar to what they actually ended up being mostly to do with the linguistic contact between the Norse and the English. And as long as we're on that topic, let's draw the boundary at the other end. So while these boundaries are largely arbitrary, you didn't, for example, wake up on New Year's Eve in 1049 speaking Old English, and then all of a sudden the next day find yourself speaking Middle English, barely able to understand yourself, your memories or your thoughts from the previous day. We're on a gradient here. And any, any gradient is going to be arbitrary to a degree. This is true of linguistic gradients, biological gradients, or really any other, any other gradient that you can name. That said, generally speaking, 1500 is considered the end of the Middle English period and the beginning of the early modern English period. This has largely to do with something called the Great Vowel Shift, which we'll be discussing very soon. As long as we're talking about boundaries, I just use the term early modern English, and there's a reason for this as well. There's another distinction, I guess you might say, and this one's a little fuzzy, somewhere between about 1700 and about 1750, between early modern English and I guess what we might call contemporary English. We'll talk about that, of course, in a few weeks when we get there, but when I refer to specific periods, those are the, the, the borders that I mean. So Old English is English from about 450 to about 1050. That is, it's the longest period, really. Middle English from about 1050 to 1500. Modern English from about 1500 to the current time with a kind of a fuzzy boundary at about the halfway point. Anyways, on with today's talk. The first thing we might ask is, who are the Normans? Well, the brief answer, and that's really the only answer we need for, for the purposes of this class, are that the Normans were Scandinavian settlers, that is, Vikings who had just taken up residence in the part of France that came to be known as Normandy. Norman just means Northman. And at the time of the, uh, at the, time of the invasion, they had been there for about 150 years or so. They had lost the habit of speaking Old Norse, and yet were still very warlike, as, as were their, their, their Norse forebears, but had taken up speaking French, as the Norse who settled in English ultimately took up speaking in English. And the Norse who established the Kingdom of Russia, who were known, by the way, as the Rus, that is, Russia means land of the Swedish people, had taken up speaking Russian. William, Duke of Normandy, was at the time of the invasion, 1066, formerly a vassal of King Philip I of France. Philip was still quite young at the time. He had been on the throne for, I think, seven years. He was only about 14 years old or so, and his mother was acting as regent. In fact, it was only in 1066 that Philip formally began ruling the Kingdom of France. Now, this, this relationship between the Duke of Normandy and the King of France, this relationship of vassalage, is very important for much of the subsequent history of, uh, of English-French relations, and therefore English-French language relations. We'll get to that in time. 
Now, as for the reasons for the invasion, ultimately this goes back to Knut, sometimes called Knut the Great, the first, the first king actually to rule over a unified England. He was Danish himself. And as I think I mentioned before, he ruled over a, a unified sphere of England, Denmark, and Norway. So effectively, a Scandinavian empire, and sometimes it actually is called the, uh, the North Sea Empire. But as I said, Canute died in 1035. When Canute died, he was succeeded by his son, Hartha Canute, who lived until 1042, I believe, and was then succeeded by his half-brother, Edward. Now, Edward was also a member of the House of Wessex, that is, of Alfred the Great's house. And Edward is kind of the problem here, because who inherits from Edward is the question that settled in 1066. So here's the kerfuffle. Edward, in a deathbed bequeathal, leaves the kingdom to Harold Godwinson, a kinsman of Canute the Great, and also son of Godwin, Earl of Wessex. Now, in 1066, the Anglo-Saxon Wittgenemot met and confirmed Harold as king. The Wittgenemot was the Council of Nobles, very much like the All Thing in other Germanic countries. So that should have been fairly straightforward. Unfortunately, a couple of other people were interested in the throne, one of them being William Duke of Normandy, who had claimed that Edward had promised him the throne. Now, there was and is no evidence that this promise was ever made. So I think we probably have to just lump this in with um, a long list of things that we have now come to call alternative facts over the last few years, because I guess lie is such a dirty word. In any case, William really wanted the throne. And he wasn't the only one. Harold III of Norway also wanted a piece of the action. Now, Harold was an interesting and very opportunistic guy. His full name was Harold Sigurdsson, and in the sagas, he's known as Harold Hardrada. That Hardrada can mean, well, hard is hard. It can also be stern, something like that. Rada can be counsel, advice. It's, it, it's related to the Old English word uh, rede, read, which is advice, counsel. So the king Athelred Unrad, often mistranslated as Athelred the Unready, basically means Athelred the Unwise. Well, uh, Harold, uh, Hardrada, is Harold, basically Harold the Tough Ruler, or Harold Hard Council, something like that. Anyways, Harry Baby wanted England, and in 1066, with the death of Edward, and the support of Harold Godwinson's brother, Tostig, launched an invasion into northern England. So there were actually two battles for the sovereignty of England in 1066. The first one, near York at Stamford Bridge, was Harold versus Harold. In that one, Harold won. <laughs> but um, not long after the victory, they got a message that William had just landed at Hastings in Kent. So they had to, after fighting one major battle to determine who was going to be king of England, double time it down to the very southernmost part of the kingdom and fight another army already totally exhausted. So, you know, they lost. Harold quite famously took an arrow in the eye and William of Normandy became the King of England. A lot happened as a result of that arrow. And today we're going to look at the beginnings of many of those changes. As for the occupation following the, uh, the Norman conquest, this was very, very different from the occupation following the Anglo-Saxon conquest because the people coming in were not the same people. They were not the same level of society. When the Anglo-Saxons came in, they effectively displaced or completely absorbed the Celtic population. Largely, they pushed them back. But where they didn't push them back, they absorbed them, they um, culturally simply ran over them. And in many ways, their cultures were, were on a level at that time. This is probably one of the reasons why there are so few Celtic words in, in English, is, is that the words that the Celts had from their native vocabulary were for the same kind of thing that 
that the Anglo-Saxons had and the words that the Celts had for their high culture, which by this point was the culture of the church, came from Latin anyway. There are other reasons as well, of course, but, but that's, that, that's one. Anyways, that was a bit of a distraction, but something also I meant to address uh, during our first, first week. But as for, as for the Norman conquest, as for the Norman occupation, this was not a mass migration of populations. This was not an influx of peasant farmers, as, as was the case with the Anglo-Saxons. These were conquerors, these were nobles, these were administrators, these were high church officials. But the, the peasantry, the Anglo-Saxon peasantry, remained the Anglo-Saxon peasantry. And this is why, whereas... English, the language of the Anglo-Saxons, displaced the languages of the Romanized Celts, be they Latin or Britonic of some kind. This is why French did not displace English as, as the spoken language of the population. It displaced it in other ways, but not as the language of the broad population. In fact, at most, there were probably about 5% of the population in England in the centuries following the conquest who were Norman, and maybe as few as 1%, the, the vast majority of the population of England remained English. And this includes lower nobility as well. It was the upper nobility that was completely replaced, but the lower nobility, the local knights, many of them simply remained in place and had to swear fealty to a Norman lord rather than an Anglo-Saxon lord. But aside from that, many of their lives wouldn't have changed all that much. That said, the lives of the French or Norman nobility, upper nobility, as well as the lives of the, of the upper church officials, the bishops and the archbishops, these remained quite distinct from the lives of the Anglo-Saxons for quite a long time. The marriages of the royal family, for example, were arranged with European nobility, continental nobility, not with Anglo-Saxons. And many of the high church officials were drawn from those upper Norman families. A lot of second sons or third sons found themselves in the church. Whereas, again, uh, a number of the lower church officials deacons, that kind of thing, remained Anglo-Saxon. And many of the French nobles as well had a split identity between being English and being French, because of course, the nobles who came over with William had land in France. Many of them held land under William, who of course was the Duke of Normandy. That is, he was one of the great nobles of France. And up until, up until 1204, the Anglo-Normans continued to hold property and continued to hold titles on both sides of, of the English Channel. So there was this Norman culture, this largely French culture that spanned the English Channel in, the same, in a similar way to how there was this Northern Germanic culture under Canute, for example, that spanned the North Sea. But in 1204... Because of tensions between the English and the French, tensions arising from, among other things, the fact that William, as a vassal of the King of France and now the King of England, gave the King of France an excuse to claim kingship of England. <laughs> um, uh, so so the, 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 we'll call it a discussion between who was in charge of England and who was in charge of France, the English or the French, wasn't ever really settled until pretty much the end of the Middle Ages. And one of the titles of, of the King of England, or the Monarch of England, for many, many centuries continued to be King of France, even though that wasn't really a thing. That said, many of the Angevin kings, who, who were the kings following after, after William and before the, the, the Plantagenets, had such large holdings in France that more than half of France at one point was under Angevin authority. But like I said, in 1204, the, the nobles of England and France, any of the ones who held property on both sides of the channel were forced to choose. They were basically told, you can only keep one. Either you're English or you're French, but you can't be both. And from that point on, 
French and the influence of French declined in England and in English. It never went away. Still hasn't really gone away. But because French was the language of the upper class, it also very quickly became a marker of socioeconomic identity. That is, French is something that rich people speak. French is something that powerful people speak. And if you want to move in those circles, you'd better learn French. And this is true even after 1204, even after the, uh, the English lose Normandy to the King of France. But well into the early modern period, French remained, the acquisition of French remained a mark of cultivation. And I guess now's as good a time as any to mention broadly the effect that the particular way in which the Normans came in and the particular way in which the Normans cemented the rule of, of England, the effect that had on, on the English language. Up until the Norman Conquest, the language of administration in England was, as you might expect, English. Because, you know, it's England. That's the language the people speak. So this was the language of administration. It was the language of military organization. And it was a language that was capable of handling the complexities of philosophy. And that, by the way, is an important marker of how flexible and subtle a language can be. And when I say it was capable of handling the complexities of philosophy, I'm referring specifically to Alfred the Great's translation of Boethius's work, The Consolation of Philosophy, which after the Bible was for a thousand years the most widely read book in Europe. Boethius was a late Roman senator, a Christian, who was implicated in a plot to assassinate the emperor. I don't think he actually was guilty, but he was implicated. And if he was, hey, you know, um, Rome was a pretty fucked up place by that point anyways. In any case, he was sentenced to execution by beheading. And while he was in jail waiting for his, waiting for his execution, he wrote this book, The Consolation of Philosophy, which was basically an imagined dialogue between him and an, an allegorical lady philosophy who was offering him consolation on his coming death. And it's a wonderful book. I recommend that you all read it if you get a chance, especially if you're interested in the Middle Ages. And I say this as a person who is not a believer in any religion whatsoever. But it's a good book. It's a good work of philosophy, and it's a very interesting read. It's, it's broken up into five sections, and the sections themselves are broken up into prose pieces and, and poetic passages. And some of Alfred's translations, particularly of, of the poetic passages from Latin into Old English, are, are really lovely poetically. Incidentally, Chaucer also translated Boethius, as did Elizabeth I. Like I said, this was a, an important book to the culture, and it's one that if you want to be serious about understanding the Western European Middle Ages, you need to have in your repertoire. But that wasn't something I planned on talking about today, so I'm going to stop talking for this slide and move on to the next slide and then talk some more. So in short then, in terms of the general effect of the Norman occupation and the Norman conquest on English society, this was a permanent change in the direction towards which England looked. It had been part of the Scandinavian world, a part of the Northern European world. Its principal ties had been with the various Scandinavian countries. From 1066 on, England looks south, except when the, have, they're having problem with those pesky Scots. We'll get around to them later because, hey, um, as a person of Scottish descent, I just love stories of when the Scots give the English a hard time. As a, as, a, as a congenital anti-authoritarian, this just warms the cockles of my heart, whatever the fuck a cockle is. 
Okay, apparently a cockle is a shellfish. It's a relative of the clam. Sorry, not even a fish, a mollusk. Why do our hearts have cockles? I don't want cockles on my heart. It sounds profoundly unhealthy. But that's another digression. Moving on. So let's start with a few basics. For one, and I just mentioned Alfred the Great uh, a couple of slides ago, English, which had by this point developed a pretty sophisticated and effective written standard. And this, by the way, is one of the reasons Alfred the Great is called Alfred the Great, not just because he was a good military guy, but because he was such an important figure in the culture. But that largely came to an end with the Norman occupation. English, which had developed, uh, a, like I said, a very effective written standard and had become, as Alfred was able to demonstrate, capable of handling any of the subtleties that the discipline of philosophy could throw at it, no longer had that connection to writing. And for a long time, for, for 150 years after the Norman Conquest, very, very little English was written down. Some was, but not that much for the very simple reason that education was not universal. Most people couldn't read. And this is true in France, by the, uh, by the way, as well. The peasants didn't need to read to do their job, and the English peasants didn't need to read to do their job. The people who needed to read were people in government and people in the church. Well, their language was French. So English is completely removed from what we would call high culture for a long time. And when I say a long time, what I mean is 300 years from 1066 until 1360, 66, somewhere around there, I'll have to look up the exact date. Parliament in England was conducted in French. So there's a 300 year gap in which the government of England did not speak English. Well, this cutting loose, this lopping off the head of, of English effectively means a number of things. One, it means that a lot of vocabulary is going to be lost. All of the philosophic terms, all of the military terms, all of the religious terms, or most of them, all of the administrative terms, that old English had developed and it had a full, full complement of those. Those are gone. Those are no longer part of our language. Most of our words that do those jobs come from French, which means ultimately they also come from Latin. Similarly, because English is no longer attached to a standard of writing, it no longer falls under the conservative influence of writing. That is, if it's just a spoken language, and I don't mean that as a slight, there's no seemingly objective standard to which one can appeal to, for, for correctness. So we see a flourishing of multiple dialects in different parts of the country. And some of these are really quite lovely. And I'm over the next few weeks, we'll take a look at a few of them rather than just the, the one that became modern English, standard modern English, because they're a lot of fun. But these developed in relative isolation for a few hundred years and, and in their own ways were totally capable, completely capable of, of anything that you might want a literary language to do. But I'm getting ahead of myself. Another effect was that developments already in progress were probably sped up. Certainly, they're allowed to progress. One of these, and we've talked about this already, was the loss of inflections largely coming about because of the contact of the English and the Norse, whose common vocabulary made it easy for the languages to merge, but whose different inflectional endings made it really confusing for either one of those to make sense to the other. And as a result of that loss of inflections, we see an increase in prepositions doing the job that inflections used to do. Similarly, we see word order becoming more and more important, again, as the language becomes a more analytic rather than, rather than synthetic language. And there is also fairly quickly a disappearance of grammatical gender. Because, of course, French has grammatical gender. Old Norse has grammatical gender. Old English has grammatical gender. Grammatical gender is an Indo-European thing. But 
where you've got three languages now, each with different ideas of which gender belongs to what word, the whole notion of grammatical gender becomes at best useless and at worst really confusing, and we just don't need it. So by the end of the Middle English period, or even, even by not that far into the Middle English period, it was basically, except where it really was important, uh, gender schmender, basically. Grammatical gender disappears, and we use what we call natural gender. And the reason for this is that in, in the Germanic languages and in the Romance languages, different standards, different assumptions of what was masculine and what was feminine, grammatically speaking, grammatical gender, applied. Uh, for example, in... Um, in the Romance language, the word for bridge, I believe, is, uh, is masculine, whereas in the Germanic languages, it's feminine. Again, we just don't need it. And as for the merger of old, uh, of old English and Old Norse in the north of England, we've already talked about that a fair bit. And because neither of these languages were involved in the government of the country, they simply merged and became very distinctive and very interesting dialects of English. Another change, and you could probably intuit this one from what we were talking about a few min minutes ago, is a reduction in the status of English, which, which really is still apparent in, in contemporary English diction. Because as I said, French was the language of government for 300 years, it was the language of cultivation, the language of education, the language of power, both political and economic. So English, although it never went away and, conti and continued to be spoken, it was really, especially in the early Middle English period, a peasant language. It was a language of the lower class. Now, what this means functionally is that certain assumptions about words and about how words sound and where they come from enter the language at this point, and we've never really shaken those off. A good example of this is the change that takes place in word formation. We talked about word formation in Old English, about the, the use of affixing, that is prefixing and suffixing, and compounding, both of which are common and are still practiced in the other Germanic languages, but compounding effectively disappears from English during the Middle English period, and we never really get it back. And the reason is that because English for quite a long time was a language of low status, and where new words coming into the language were largely coming in from more educated classes, who spoke French, then the, the dominant method of, of new word formation since then has been borrowing. In the example I used before, I'll bring up again, the German word for a telephone is Fernsprecher, which is just German for far speaker. It's a good compound. But the English word for telephone is a compound that means basically far speaker, but in Greek, not English. If we say far speaker, oh, the far speaker is ringing. It sounds weird. And that kind of has always disturbed me that new words made from um, English vocabulary sound weird to us. We simply assume that we need to go to some other language to make our new words because there's something not good enough about ours. This, this bothers the crap out of me. So, Give some thought, and I asked you to do this at the end of the talk on, on word formation. Give some thought to uh, your assumptions about how we make new words and where new words come from, and, and why it is that we still take so many words from other languages, and I think that's a great thing. Other languages are wonderful sources of vocabulary, but we tend also to sell our own resources short. Now, one, one result of that is that we now have the largest vocabulary in the world. But another result of that is that, as we talked about in class the other day, only 1% of our vocabulary actually is native English words. In any case, obviously it works. So, you know, I can't sit in judgment over it. If a language does the job, if a language does what a language needs to do, it's a good language and English does a good job.
Um, but a lot of our assumptions about what is good language and what is bad language are still bound up in almost thousand year old politics. The politics coming out of the Norman conquest are still the politics that govern our linguistic sensibilities. This is this persistence of really vanished politics in linguistic assumptions is to me fascinating. In terms of literature, the changes are also pretty profound, especially in the South. And ultimately it is a Southern dialect, the dialect of London that becomes standard modern English. But as I was saying, the, uh, the, the impact on poetry is profound. Old English meter, and you may remember this from the reading of the, uh, of the wander that I did, is alliterative. It doesn't rhyme. It's based on predictable patterns of words within the same line beginning with the same sound. If any of you are curious about what exactly those patterns are, I'd be happy to talk to you about them. Basically, there are four to choose from, and they can be used at any way in any time, depending on the needs of the poem and, and the poet's ability and the available words. And that is the standard meter of Germanic poetry. Even, even in some of the Norse poetry where, where rhyme is used, that's an innovation. The traditional poetry in Germanic languages is alliterative. On the other hand, the traditional poetry of Old French, of Old French epic, for example, the, uh, the various chansons de geste, though those are the French epics, the songs of deeds, that's what the term means, is not alliteration, but also not quite rhyme. It's something called assonance. That is the last syllable of successive lines will contain the same vowel sound. It may not end in the same consonant, so it's not an exact rhyme, but it will contain the same vowel sound. In modern English, we call this slant rhyme, and sometimes it looks like sloppy rhyming. It's not. It's just a different technique. But Old French at the time was also adopting end rhyme as a technique, as, as a, as I suppose a more refined development of assonance. So what we see, especially in, as I said, the South, is an increase in the use of rhyme and a virtual disappearance fairly quickly of alliteration. Now, I have to say that with several grains of salt because for the first hundred, almost 150 years after the Norman Conquest, very little English poetry was written down. Some was, but not much. Not enough to make a definitive case about what people working in the native poetic tradition were actually doing. If you want to do that, you probably have to look north, because in the north, alliteration continued. Scholars used to refer to much of the poetry of the 13th and 14th century in the north of England as the alliterative revival, but really it's more accurate to say that in the north, alliteration never really went away. But in the south, it did. Of course, the, the south is where London is. It's the center of political power. And this is another thing that the Normans did that the Anglo-Saxons didn't do quite to the same extent. They centralized power, not as completely as in the modern nation state, but far more, far, far more than the Anglo-Saxon kings were actually able to do. And maybe even then they wanted to do, I'm not exactly sure. I mean, hell, there were very few Anglo-Saxon kings of England as a whole. As you know, there were multiple kingdoms all over the place, but under William, there was a, a single unified England and there was a unified England under Canute as well. But that's also a digression and it's not a rabbit hole I want to go down just now. So instead of tying myself and therefore you in knots, I think we'll take a little bit of a look at vocabulary. One really nice way into discussing the changes that English vocabulary underwent subsequent to the Norman invasion is to look at one of the wonderful historical novels of, of Sir Walter Scott, one of the great British, one of the great Scottish novelists. Scott was a historian and he also wrote some fantastic historical novels. My favorite is Waverley, which is based around the Highland Uprising of 1745-46. And if you want to read one 
Scott novel, I would recommend that one. But I've read most of his books and they're all, all quite good. Certainly better than his poetry. In any case, his best known book is probably Ivanhoe. And there's this conversation in Ivanhoe between two characters around around how English actually works, depending on what class you belong to. And it's between uh, uh, a, a peasant and a jester. And it goes like this. Why, how call you those grunting brutes running about on their four legs, demanded Wamba. Swine, fool, swine, said the herd. Every fool knows that. And swine is good Saxon, said the jester. But how call you the sow when she is flayed and drawn and quartered and hung up by the heels like a traitor? Pork, answered the swineherd. I am very glad every fool knows that too, said Wamba. And pork, I think, is good Norman French. And so, when the brute lives and is in charge of a Saxon slave, she goes by her Saxon name, but becomes a Norman and is called pork when she is carried to the castle hall to feast among the nobles. What dost thou think of this, friend Gurth, ha? Huh? It is but too true doctrine, friend Wamba, however it got into thy fool's pate. Nay, I can tell you more, said Wamba, in the same tone. There is old Alderman Ox continues to hold his Saxon epithet when he's under the charge of serfs and bondsmen such as thou, but becomes beef a fiery French gallant when he arrives before the worshipful jaws that are destined to consume him. Meinherr Kalf, too, becomes Monsieur de Vaux in like manner. He is Saxon when he requires tendance and takes a Norman name when he becomes a matter of enjoyment. What Scott is getting at here is something called English-French doubling. That is, we tend to have multiple words, often one English and one French, or more, that refer to the same thing, either under different circumstances, as in the animal food dichotomy that he was describing, but also in other contexts as well. Where English-French doubling occurs, there is virtually always a difference in social register. That is, something can seem more sophisticated, less sophisticated, of a higher cultural level or of a lower cultural level depending on what kind of word you use to refer to it. Consider, for example, boat, craft, or ship, which are everyday words. Fishermen use these words. But vessel, fishermen don't use that word. And I say this, of course, in a province that has a long history of fishermen, speaking to at least some students who I know have fishermen in their family. Similarly, skipper and captain. Captain has more an air of formality to it, doesn't it? Even when we take a look at higher up, supposedly, words, kingly versus royal or regal. Now, we were talking about the respective etymologies of king on the one hand and roi on the other, the one having to do with relatedness and representation and the other having to do with ruling over. So that makes sense here. Or even knight and cavalier, they, they mean the, the same thing. But depending on which one you use, it is going to sound different, feel different to the, uh, to the person you're speaking to. That is, they, they have the same denotative meaning. They signify exactly the same thing, or at least close enough to exactly the same thing for most purposes. But their connotative meanings are very different. They carry different emotional registers. They carry different emotional associations. I mentioned before that every word floats in a semantic cloud. That's my own term. It's not a formal term, but I find it useful. The semantic cloud of knight is not the same as the semantic cloud of cavalier. Similarly, tool and implement. These mean effectively the same thing. But when was the last time you heard a carpenter talk about his implements? No, I, I have a toolbox. I'm not even a carpenter. I have a toolbox. I don't have an implement box. Or if we can continue with this theme, because it's fun, I love words, and looking at different words and different histories of words is exciting to me. This course gets more exciting as it goes along, if you're a word geek, because the number of different sources and origins of words just keeps expanding. It's great. And of course, they all do different things. 
it's moments like this I realize that I am one of the luckiest people in the world because I have a job that I love. But onward. Okay, that is something that I think, but it is really not something that I cogitate. But think and cogitate mean the same thing. We use think all the time. And this is where there's where there's English French doubling. Um, the English word will be the word we use every day. Speaking of which, um, other other examples would be drink. Of course, just from the old English word drinken, which can function as a verb or a noun, but has doubles coming from French, imbibe as a verb, and beverage as a noun. Notice also that in most cases, not all but most, the Anglo-Saxon words are shorter. If you want to be concise, use Old English. And by the way, I say this as a person who views conciseness as one of the signs of good writing. Just a little hint for your essays. But moving on on the food and drink theme, we have food versus victuals or viands. And again, these mean the same thing, but if you start talking to somebody in everyday conversation about your victuals, they're going to look at you a little bit funny because nobody talks that way in conversation. These are more formal words. Similarly, home and domicile or kill and terminate or exterminate. That one kind of confuses me a bit too. Don't worry because of course X is a negator, but terminate and exterminate mean the same thing. I guess, I don't know, maybe exterminate is like really, really kill. I'm not exactly sure there. Even though I am both a teacher and a pedant, I'd rather sound like a teacher. If you say I sound like a pedant, it's probably going to sound to me like I'm sounding kind of pretentious. But continuing on this theme, because words are really fun. Think about freedom and liberty and how different <laughs> the, 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 the climactic scene of that god-awful movie Braveheart would have been if, <laughs> if Mel Gibson's sort of characterization of the great Sir William Wallace were to end with the words liberty instead of freedom. They have completely different feelings, don't they? Both in the mouth and in the ear. Same with friend and companion, give, provide, help, assist, wise, prudent. And what I've found with some of these though is, and, and here I need to actually acknowledge the, the different places from which students come. Different students I've found over the years feel differently about a lot of these pairs. Some are more comfortable with one, some are more comfortable with the other. So we certainly definitely can't take a, a, an absolute or homogenizing approach to any of them. That's one of the things I love about this course is I'm always learning about not just language, but about language and people, largely through the people I teach. Which, of course, is a very human way to learn about language. You know, you speak to people who have different relationships with it. I'm going to hold off on that one now because there's something else in a few minutes that I want to address that really kind of gets into those differences. And it has a lot to do with how many languages we know, what order we learned them in, and, and how we use them, what situations we use them in. But if we can take a digression that's not really a digression, why is the word shit rude? Have you ever wondered that? It's just, it's just a word for poop. Poop isn't rude. Why is shit rude? This kind of bothers me. I mean, okay, I swear a lot and well, <laughs> I just do. Um, why are some words just by their own nature considered rude and others not? And more importantly for our purposes, where do our rude words come from? Did you know, for example, that a common term for a swear word, what we now call a four-letter word, used to be an Anglo-Saxon word. And shit is a good example. You ever wonder where shit comes from? I mean, I know you know where shit comes from, but linguistically, it comes from the Old English word shitan. Say that a few times in your head. Shitan, shitan, shitan. You know what it means? It means to poop. There's nothing rude about it. All it means is to take that which is in your bowels and make it so that it is no longer in your bowels. So, it's shit. 
Or if you want to conjugate it into the past, it's shot. So I shit, I shat. Great, we still have that. It still conjugates. It's a perfectly functional fucking word. But for some reason, it's become rude. So, <laughs> how does one shit politely? Well, one defecates. If you want to poop politely, do it in Latin. If you want to just get down and do your business, do it in English. Because apparently defaicare is more polite than shitan. Shitan's more direct. Defaicare is more polite. Maybe things are more polite if it takes f***ing longer to f***ing say them. Which seems to often be the case in our distinctions between low and middle or high diction. Funny that. I mean, seriously, why would we decide that the more of my time you get to waste, the more polite you are? But moving away from poop and also from single words into complete sentences, let's take a look at two sentences which mean about the same thing. One using Latinate and one using Germanic vocabulary. So, on the Latin side, we have assisting one's companions is prudent and virtuous. And on the Germanic side, we have helping one's friends is wise and good. Now, these two sentences mean about the same thing, but they will be received differently. They feel different in your ears. And a few slides ago, I was talking about the different ways in which students I've taught over the years have reacted to words coming out of either uh, the Romance languages or the Germanic languages. And I was thinking specifically about these two sentences because I always bring up these two sentences when I'm teaching this course. And the first time I did it, I simply assumed that my students would find the Germanic one more comfortable because quite frankly, I do. But I found that a number of them actually find assisting one's companions is prudent and virtuous more accessible than helping one's friends is wise and good. So naturally, I wanted to, to, to explore that one a little further. So what I took to doing and what I would have done with you folks had we been meeting face to face is ask you that same question. And then when you respond, ask, what is your first language and how many languages do you know? And what I've generally found, not universally, but generally, is that people, no matter how fluent they are in English, if their first language is a Romance language, and most commonly this is going to be French, although I've taught a number of students whose first language is uh, Spanish, they're more comfortable with assisting one's companions as prudent and virtuous. This feels more accessible to them because, of course, the vocabulary is more closely related to the vocabulary of their first language. Whereas my students whose first language is English tend to find helping one's friends is wise and good more accessible than assisting one's companions is prudent and virtuous. Not universally, but generally speaking, this is the pattern that I've noticed in my own experience. I think that actually says a lot and it's worth actually pondering on because as I mentioned, I think in our first lecture or so, the effect that language has on our thoughts in ways that we're not even aware of really comes out in the respective or relative comfort levels with these two sentences. Because really they do mean about the same thing, but their semantic clouds are different. And we all prefer to float in the semantic cloud of our native language. Neither one's better than the other. None of them are better than any of the other ones. Honestly, as I've said before, and as I'll say again, if a language serves the needs of its speech community, it is a good language, and that's the only standard that you ever need to go by. But this is a nice way of looking at the way, not just that Germanic and Latinate or Romance languages feel different, but at the ways in which, the languages in which we learn to think, inform every facet of what gets processed by our thoughts, of what we process through our thoughts. And 
I'm not quite sure where to go with that, but this is a subject of endless fascination for me. So I'm just going to move on to the next slide. But let's take a closer look at those sentences. And here I've color coded the words by etymology. So Latin at red, Germanic blue. Assisting one's companions is prudent and virtuous. Helping one's friends is wise and good. Notice, and this was not something I chose for. It was something that emerged from the sentences as I was looking at them. Both sentences rely upon Germanic words to function. One's, of course, is a, a, a possessive personal pronoun. Is and and. And I mentioned the other day that even though the number of old English words in the modern English language is very small, like 1%. These are the words we can't do without, many of them. And, and these two sentences actually really exemplify that. The topic words, that is the words that tell you what the sentence is about, can be either Latinate or Germanic. But the function words, the ones that tell you what the sentence is actually doing, those have to be Germanic. And this is why even though the vast majority of the vocabulary or lexicon of the English language is not Old English, is in fact Latinate, really, why, why English is still classified as a Germanic language. It's those functional words and the understandings that go along with them that link English to the many other Germanic languages that maintain a very different and more, more uh, native or indigenous vocabulary than we actually do that makes them Germanic languages. Now, again, I'm not trying to be a purist. I, there are people who actually think that the non-Germanic words of the English language should be expunged. I am not one of those. I love words, all words, wherever the hell they come from. I, uh, give me all the words. The fact that my first language is the biggest language in the world if measured by lexicon is a source of great joy for me because that is just, it gives me things to explore and I love exploring. Um, but I'm getting sidetracked again. I'm not even sure how that sentence began, but I'm not going to start it again because <laughs> I'm trying honestly to to make these as much like live lectures as possible and uh, those of you who have actually been in live classes with me know that uh, <laughs> I babble and I lose track of things and and sometimes it goes someplace that's a lot of fun and someplace it really ends up being a profound waste of time. I hope this isn't one of those. What I mostly wanted to do with this one was look at the classification of language, not as understood by number of words. If, if, if it was understood by number of words, English would have become a Romance language, but by function of words. And we can keep borrowing words from language after language after language, and I hope we do. But our connecting words, the words that make the language actually work, will probably always be those words that come out of Old English. In any case, I hope you find this interesting, and, uh, and I think it may be time to move on to a different topic. Just briefly, before I let you go and pick things up in a couple of days. But for now, that's about all I wanted to say about vocabulary. As for grammar, that's a whole new lecture, and one that neither you nor I have time for right now. We'll get into it eventually. In the meantime, I do want to leave you with some at least general idea of how the Norman invasion affected the English language grammatically. So, one, we've talked about this already, the loss of most of our inflections. Middle English, although kind of a, a, a middling, wishy-washy, one way or the other language, because it's not really a language, it's just a period that has various dialects in it, is mostly an analytic language. That is, it mostly relies on word order rather than inflection to determine meaning within sentences. So very early on in the Middle English period, we see that word order is more important than inflection in determining meaning. Other, other changes in grammar that were just uh, 
generally fairly quickly incorporated into the English language after the Norman invasion. One is the change in word order in sentences. The modern English word order of subject, verb, object dates back to the Middle English period. In Old English, if you read it, and I hope some of you will, some of you probably have, was more commonly subject, object, verb. But there was more flexibility because, of course, the case endings could help you out a lot. But in modern English, which is an analytic language, this requires a really firm fixation on word order. Also, the perfect tenses, that is the tenses with have or had, I have gone, I had gone, that kind of thing, and we'll talk about those in a couple of weeks, came in largely from French. They were still, they were present a little bit in Old English, in later Old English, and I know in at least one example that I looked at with you, they were there, but it's in modern English and coming out of French that these really come in. And they're a real, real improvement, quite frankly, in the language because they give us different ways of relating to time that Old English simply didn't have, as much as I love Old English. Of course, and I mentioned this to you before, the strong verbs are reduced because they're very confusing. And the weak verbs increased because they're easy. That is, a number of strong verbs became weak. A number of other strong verbs simply disappeared. And almost every verb coming into the language from other languages, mostly at this time French, would become weak because, as I've said before, they're easy. So most of our verbs now are weak verbs because of the Norman conquest. And this is why we call most of our surviving strong verbs irregular verbs because most people just don't understand them. And for now, I think that's about it. I'll continue in a couple of days with other elements of early Middle English, which I quite frankly haven't even decided upon yet. There's lots of things to choose from because to be really, really, really honest, it's despite the fact that I, uh, I, I specialized in Old English, Middle English is my favorite period, probably because of the variety of dialects that are available and the different kinds of poetry that are available there and that disappear in the modern English period for reasons we'll discuss. This is a really um, heterogeneous time for the language and, and really kind of eclectic time for the language. And it's wonderful and beautiful and exciting. And I, I look forward to exploring it with you more over the next few weeks. Thank you so much for bearing with me. And I will talk to you again in a couple of days. Bye-bye.